Howdy folks, welcome back to Steampunk Death Row channel. This week we're going to get back to classic literature, in particular dystopian fiction. This is one of the most important categories of science fiction. Many of these books have had a great impact on our culture and have gone mainstream. In fact, people tend to forget that they're sci-fi. Uh, because back in the day when sci-fi was not respectable, these books were still considered respectable and got good reviews. When you're talking about dystopias, two stand out head and shoulders above the rest. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and 1984 by Eric Blair, better known by his pen name, George Orwell. A few years ago, I did a video of my top 10 dystopias, but I only got to do a very short and cursory overview of each. Since then, I keep thinking, what about the big two? <laughs> Which is the more accurate? Which did a better job of predicting the bad things that have happened since they were written? Which is the better book? How do their ideas differ? Because in many ways, they are the opposite. With these ideas in mind, let's get right to it. things a lot of people may not realize is that Brave New World is by far the earlier book, having been published way back in 1932. It came on the heels of the decadence of the 1920s, you know, the jazz era, uh, the Weimar Republic in Germany, all, you know, this is the era of cabaret in, in Berlin, you know, when it begins. And this was just before Hitler's seizure of power in Germany. So it was kind of the crux of a historical event. 1984, however, came out in 1949, immediately after the horrors of World War II and, you know, all the death, all the bombings, all the camps. Now, that fact alone may explain why the tone is so different between the two. The first is a dystopia of hedonism and scientific managerialism. The second is a grim, brutal system that combines the worst elements of Bolshevik Russia and Nazi Germany. Both books were very influential, but 1984 seems to have been more so. Well, they always show up on the top 100 lists, but 1984 is usually close to the top, <laughs> and uh, Brave New World not so much. I am old enough to remember the public discussion that occurred when the year 1984 rolled around. Some of the commentary by, you know, pundits, journalists, and especially politicians was purely idiotic. Look, they said, Orwell got it wrong. Here we are, and there's nothing even close to his predictions. They missed the fact that the choice of the year was somewhat arbitrary. In fact, the protagonist is unsure in the book what year it really is because the party is always changing history. Now, there's a legend that Orwell simply flipped the year, flipped the digits of the year that he was writing in the book in, 1948. Uh, but supposedly, according to Wikipedia, that's not true. Who knows? You know, Wikipedia isn't always the most accurate either. Uh, but anyway, the original title was supposed to be The Last Man in Europe, which I would have to agree was a terrible title. One reaction I remember fondly, or vividly, let's say, fondly because it was funny, was that of Nancy Reagan, the first lady of the U.S., who was by then best known for her anti-drug campaign. She said, we are much closer to Brave New World because in that book, everybody does a drug called Soma, and now so many people are on drugs. <laughs> I felt this was an even more ignorant <laughs> uh, comment than a lot of other comments by these politicians because... At the time, the government was not encouraging drug use as they were in Huxley's book. No, no, they were persecuting drug users, uh, sometimes quite viciously. And so it has changed since then. And since then, there's a lot of psychiatric drugs that people are on. You know, that's pretty common. Even children, you know, they, they can't pay attention in traffic class, so they, we put them on drugs. And of course, we have legal weed, which isn't as much something the government's promoting, just something they want to profit off of. <laughs> but in any case, she may have been somewhat prophetic in her words. 
Now, since each of these books has a strong message, it is easy to forget that they both have a plot and they both have characters who are compelling. And uh, a very interesting and well-written story. I'll begin with Brave New World because that came first. Now, the title is one of the best I've encountered, but like most of the best titles in English literature, it comes from Shakespeare. There is Miranda as a character in The Tempest. In this play, she says, Oh, brave new world, it has such people in it. Perfect, perfect allusion for this book. The setting is around the 25th century or so. The world has been united in a single super state. On the surface, people are prosperous and happy, but it's a dramatically different world than ours. Most significantly, the family has been abolished. People are created on assembly lines called hatcheries, which utilize what we call test tube birth. Different types of people are engineered and designed deliberately for different roles in society and raised in communal homes where they are subject to extensive conditioning during their sleep. All these messages like, you know, uh, everybody belongs to everybody, <laughs> you know, uh, have sex as much as you can, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, there are several protagonists, but I would consider three of them. Bernard Marx. He is a sleep learning specialist at the Central London Hatchery. Uh, and so it's kind of a one-stop shop. You know, they create the children here and they educate them. They raise them and educate them here. And he is an alpha plus genius. He's been engineered to be really smart, but he's also a misfit and actually admits that he's unhappy. He is shorter and less handsome than most people, which leads people to whisper. They whisper behind his back saying, oh, they made a mistake. They made a mistake when when uh, he was being created. So they put alcohol in his surrogate so he was stunted, just like they do to the lower castes. <laughs> and because of that, the girls really don't like him. But there's one that's kind of tolerant. Her name is Len in the Crown. So, of course, he is in love with her, which is considered to be mental illness because you're not supposed to focus on any one person. You're supposed to have all these affairs, right? So anyway, Lennon the Crown thinks, thinks he's kind of cute. You know, he's, his, he's charming in his eccentricity. And so he wants to impress her more than anything. Um, and even though it doesn't take much to impress her, she is a beta, which means she's intelligent, but she's not that intelligent and she's very vacuous and shallow and she works in the hatchery on the assembly line uh, so she does this kind of repetitive work but she still has to be smart so he wants to take on her a special date i'm going to go to the savage reservation in north america <laughs> now at the time the whole world is one place and everybody has the same culture and there's no national boundaries the the unique thing though is there's a few areas where they reserved the land for ancient societies to live in their ancient ways. In this case, the tribes of what we now call New Mexico. And these people, you know, live, they, they have religion, they marry, uh, they have children the normal way, but they're forbidden to leave so they don't like corrupt the rest of the world. So this is kind of a tourist thing. Let's gawk at the savages, right? But when they get there, they discover there's a woman named Linda who is actually from England. She was accidentally left behind when Bernard's boss, the director of the center, took her there on a similar date 20 years ago. And what happened was she accidentally got pregnant. She forgot her birth control, and there's no abortion in this savage reservation. So she gives birth to a child she calls John. And he is a total misfit there because... He's white, and he was born of a woman that they consider to be a slut because she has her mores, and so they reject him. Uh, so to console himself, he learns to read, and he finds a book of Shakespeare, and he's just a Shakespeare expert. So he's very literate, but he's also got these weird old-fashioned ideas. So Bernard says, if I bring this guy back, I'll be famous. So he brings uh, John back, and, and John forces him to bring back Linda, who doesn't pay much a role because she's, she's so happy to be back, she just basically overdoses on Soma. <laughs> uh, whereas, whereas John is a mini-celebrity, 
and people think his ideas are very quaint and weird. And of course, it causes this total stir that pretty much upends everybody's lives that surround him. And, and it's tragic for poor John. So just leave it at that. You know, it's, it's an interesting story. Now, the world of 1984 is the complete opposite of Brave New World. The timeline, as I said, is a little bit unsure because the party continuously changes the historical record. But let's just say it is 1984 because they had shortly after World War II, there was this nuclear war in which, you know, many parts of America and Britain and Russia were attacked. And so there was a revolution in England and America, and they became communist too, essentially. So the main protagonist, Winston Smith, he lives in London just like Bernard Marx does. Uh, but it's a very different London. It's part of the super state of Oceania, which includes the British Isles, the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, etc., and Southern Africa. It is a cruel and totalitarian place of constant shortages and total surveillance by the secret police. Uh, Winston Smith works in the Ministry of Truth because many words have changed their meaning totally. It actually means the Ministry of Propaganda. His job is to rewrite books and newspaper stories in which the party's viewpoints have changed. More particularly when the party has made a mistake, they have to correct it so it looks like the party never made the mistake, for example. Let's say they missed their quota on manufacturing of bootlaces. Well, we'll just change the quota in retrospect. So yeah, they not only hit it, they overshot the mark. Winston Smith is only in his 40s, but he remembers a time in his childhood before his father was disappeared. And yes, disappeared by the party, no doubt, uh, that things were better when he had both parents. Now, when his mother was the only parent, Things were really rough, and his sister was a baby and sickly, and those times were miserable, but he still remembers them with love. Uh, they later disappeared, and he was raised by a party facility. Now, Winston's wife, he had, and he did marry, was this shrill party fanatic who he couldn't stand, and she left him eventually, and he was relieved, and he doesn't know if she's alive or dead, but they're still married you can't really do anything without the party's permission. So you can't really divorce when he doesn't know even where he knows she, she is. Now, he suspects that O'Brien, one of his supervisors and a member of the inner party, uh, he is suspects that O'Brien is trying subtly to communicate with him, that he is a member of the resistance fighting against Big Brother and that totalitarian system. Finally, there's this intense young dark-haired woman called Julia who keeps following him around. Now, at first, Winston thinks that she's spying on him because there's a lot of amateur spies. They want to get in good with the government by reporting people for real or imagined crimes. But actually, it turns out that she loves him. She realizes he's a kindred spirit. He's a rebel. And she's a rebel, too. She likes sex. You're not supposed to enjoy sex. <laughs> you know, you're just supposed to do it out of duty. And so they have this secret affair, which is very dangerous because anything that's not expressly permitted by the party is forbidden. And anything forbidden can be punished by torture or even death, you know, as the party chooses. Now, they're meeting out in the woods, uh, away from microphones, where they can discuss how much they hate Big Brother and the status quo. And they finally decide, we're going to visit O'Brien and, and see if we can get into the resistance. Well... You know, he says, oh, yes, I'm in the resistance. And, and, you know, are you prepared to die for the resistance? Well, they say, yes, we are. But it turns out that, yeah, they're going to die. But <laughs> as they kind of expected, they are going to get caught and things are going to be really bad for them. Both books are very well written with prose that is evocative and beautiful. Uh, Huxley's is very funny. And, you know, the people are described in very interesting ways. Orwell's prose, I think, is even better. In this dingy, down, downtrodden, broken-down world of 1984, he finds these little patches of hope and beauty to outline. Like, there's a bird that's singing in the meadow where they're meeting to have sex. And it's just like this bird is a little ray of hope, a little, a little idea that maybe someday things will be better. Now, the major difference between the two is, of course, the tone. 
The setting of Brave New World is so absurd that it's very funny, very humorous at times, like I've been keep saying. <laughs> but especially the expression orgy porgy. I mean, give me a break. That's cringeworthy. And yet these people, that's what they shout when they have their little sex parties. Now, on the other hand, 1984 is relentlessly depressing. And, and as I said, there are brief periods of hope in the middle of all the hopelessness. Uh, but it always returns to hopelessness. At its end, the interrogations of the tortures are so extreme that it makes you think of Kafka plus Monty Python. It's almost a little funny it's so terrible. Neither of these books was meant to be a prediction. Both men stated this is satire. I'm not predicting the future. So that makes the remarks by all those journalists and so on in, in 1984, the real year, to be even more stupid. You know, Orwell said, I don't expect this will happen. Hopefully not. But, you know, it's a prediction of some of the things that could happen if we don't be careful. Same thing with Huxley, even more so because this is more fanciful. And he kind of used this idea based on other dystopias that were popular. Plus, he was also trying to satirize the utopian fiction of H.G. Wells. He had all these ideas of an ideal society and and Huxley said, nah, that wouldn't work. This is how it would really be. <laughs> uh, so, now Orwell, he was trying his hand at a dystopia because his book, his satire, Animal Farm, had done really well, which is a satire of Soviet politics. And so he thought, well, other people are doing a good sales with this. And Huxley did well, so I'm going to write one of my own, although he wrote his completely opposite. It's much more serious and in a way more realistic because the setting and a lot of the things that happen are derived from Stalinist Russia, from real things. I mean, Big Brother, the supposed leader, looks exactly like Joseph Stalin. The enemy of the people, the guy they're always hating in the hate rallies, the supposed rebel who has disappeared, is Emmanuel Goldstein, who looks exactly like Leon Trotsky, the exiled Bolshevik leader that uh, Stalin eventually hunted down and had murdered. <laughs> uh, and his real name was Bronstein, so note the parallels. Uh, of course, there are elements of the real world in Huxley as well. You know, these people are inspired by Henry Ford and his production lines, so they actually kind of worship him. And they also worship Sigmund Freud because he was talking about how human beings need to have more sex. Uh, but on the other hand, Orwell had a lot of real things to model on. Stalinist show trials, fanatical rallies, and this very censorious Soviet press who would airbrush people out of existence from photos, you know, after they'd been killed and they no longer existed in the view of the party. It's fascinating that we have these very opposite dystopias that both became very uh, well known and are both distressing to anyone who loves freedom. Uh, Brave New World is a land of plenty and hedonism with a surprising amount of sexuality for a book of that time period, but it's a very empty life. It's a life that's devoid of fulfillment and of, tr of actual love and family and strong attachment. In Orwell's book, the party is very prudish and anti-sex, just as USSR was in their real life. I mean, they were persecuting homosexuals, for example. Uh, and its subjects lived a world of privation. We're lucky to have the necessities of life. You couldn't trust anybody, not even your family. And there was constant fear and hate. So that's not a very present world either. Now, in, in Huxley's world, the world state has abolished war. However, under Orwell, there is continuous war between the world's three super states, Oceania, Eurasia, and East Asia. They're always shifting alliances and shifting wars. Despite these superficial differences, there are more similarities than you would expect. In both worlds, the family has been degraded. Children are largely or totally raised by the state. The past is censored and historical literature is either rewritten or banned entirely. People forget the lessons of their own past. Just a few years ago, you know, they'll be unsure about what happened. In, in the one, it's because of 
taking all that soma and because of all the distractions you know all the parties uh, you know all all the sex all the new fads and weird sports that they play in orwell's world it is the fact that the party is always rewriting history and that you are required to believe it and if you don't if you say well no it actually was this way you can be arrested it's also weird because both of these worlds confront the same problem with their economics overproduction or underconsumption same thing basically and they solve it in different ways in the world of huxley it's because people are encouraged to throw things away and buy new you know just when they tire of it not when it's even worn out in orwell's world continuous warfare takes care of that problem the factories churn it out and the Basically, the soldiers blow it up. You know, they basically are making weapons and bombs and tanks, so it gets destroyed. Be that as it may, there are still some very important lessons to learn from these books. Both stories are very compelling. In the case of Huxley, the story is so over the top that it's often very funny, as I keep saying. But yeah, there's tragedy. And the other hand, with Orwell, it's gripping, but also very depressing. I first read it at the age of 13 and vowed I never wanted to read it again. <laughs> and I think I was around 17 when I read Brave New World for the first time. Many years later, I decided, well, I'll listen to an audiobook. Huxley had no problem with finishing. Orwell, I said, I will force myself to listen to one hour per day. And I eventually got through with it. Here's the place where a lot of people would say, which did the better job of predicting what has happened and what will probably happen in the future? That's kind of outside the scope of what I want to do because I'm talking more about the literature, the literary aspects, rather than the actual political aspects of that. But I'll go over it very briefly. I think they're both right and they're both wrong. You know, we don't have such a horrible dystopia, and I don't think it's possible to have such a horrible dystopia for various reasons that I won't get into. I mean, people just can't be that all-knowing, even with technology, even with surveillance and so on. And the idea of completely engineering people from test tubes, that's probably not very practical either. But let's just say that on the one hand, we have widespread drugging of the population. We have hedonism. We have a lot of odd and non-conventional sex being promoted uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, we have a lot of surveillance. I know this. I work, <laughs> I work with video surveillance as part of my regular day job. We also have hate mobs who shout down anybody with opinions that are different from the woke approved model. And by woke, I mean obsessed with leftist ideology. Okay. And so we also have constant war because the U.S. is always going abroad seeking monsters to destroy, in the words of John Quincy Adams, which I believe it shouldn't be doing. But what can we do? <laughs> anyway, so you can see there's some of each in each book. I mean, they're both partly true and they're both mostly false. Thank God. So this has been my video comparing the two books, the two famous dystopias, Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and 1984 by George Orwell. Please let me know what you think in the comments. Please like and subscribe. And also check out my works on Amazon. I will put the links in the description as always. For now, this is Steampunk Desperado saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.